Good morning, church. It is so good to see you this morning. For those of you who are here with us, thank you for being here. I have to tell you that uh, I was thinking back to when the pandemic first started and we were not meeting and I was having to preach to a camera and how awful that was. And uh, the only person that I got to see was Joel, and Joel had this much of his eyes showing up over the camera. So I couldn't tell whether I was funny or indignant or what, but uh, it is so nice to have you here. Thank you for being here, and for those of you who are online watching, uh, thank you for being a part of our service. I know that we have people watching from all over the world, and uh, I, I had dinner last night with Orlando and Nichelle, and Nichelle is watching online, and her mom's watching online, and I think she's got some other relatives watching online, and I know it's to see Orlando to make sure he's doing all right, but I am happy that you stayed around to hear me preach, and if you didn't, you didn't get this message anyway. So anyway, we're so happy that you're here. If you're visiting with us today, you're our honored guest. Uh, we want you to know that we want you to come back at every opportunity you have, and if there is anything that we can do to help you while you're here or to answer your questions, we're glad to do that. Uh, if you filled out a visitor card and you don't know what to do with it on your way out, there's a couple of baskets here where you can drop your contribution as well as a visitor card if you want to do that. Again, thank you for being here. We've been starting this uh, series on Romans chapter 12 uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, the idea behind Romans chapter 12 is that if we are going to be disciples that make disciples, we got to understand first and foremost what it is to be a disciple of Christ. We cannot just think, okay, well, I have been saved, so I therefore I am a disciple. Uh, as a matter of fact, last week we talked about verse 1 where Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. And we talked about that at length yes, uh, last Sunday. And when we were talking about that, one of the things that I really wanted to bring across to you is that we have to be all in. We actually talked about what it meant to be all in for Jesus last week. And being committed to being Christ-like in every aspect of our life. Now, in order to understand what it means to be a Christian, in order to understand what it means to be a disciple in Romans 12, you have to go through the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. Now, I thought that I would go ahead and just read through the book of Romans until chapter 11 today, and then I thought, well, we wouldn't get out of here until midnight, and uh, I do not have the power to heal anybody if they fall out of a window. So we're not going to follow that biblical example. But I want to give you a quick rundown of the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. Number, chapters 1 through 3 talks about the fact that we are lost. Chapters 1 through 3 just talks about the fact we are doomed, we are lost. It says that no one is righteous in chapter 1 through 3. Now I want you to think about that for just a moment. For those of you who are visiting here today, I want you to know that you are sitting next to some of the best sinners in Tampa Bay. And, and it's not that they're good at sinning, but they're just sinners. That's all we are, is we are all sinners, and we all fall short of the glory of God. In, verses, in chapters 1 through 3 of the book of Romans, that's what it's saying. We are lost. But then you get to chapters 4 and 5, and guess what? We're found in verses four, th 4 through 5. And we're found because of the blood of Jesus. Life through Christ comes in chapters 4 through 5. And then in chapters 6 and 8, we are empowered. We have life through the Spirit. And that's taught in chapters 6 through 8, and then in chapters 9 through 11. And, and I want you to get this because this is so important to your walk with God. We're chosen. We're chosen. 
And he goes through the, the, the Israelites and how they were chosen at the beginning of time and how Abraham's seed and so forth. And then he talks about we who are Gentiles have been grafted into that tree. And for those of you who know about grafting and so forth, you have a good picture. If you don't know about grafting, I don't have time to explain it today. But the idea is, is that we are chosen. We are God's children. And then after chapter 11, he goes into this chapter 12. And 12 through 16 is how we should live, being that we were lost, that we have been found, we have been empowered, and that we are chosen during this. Here's how you're going to live. And the very first thing he says to us is that it's about relationships, and he starts with our relationship with God. Romans 12 through 16 is how to behave. And for those of you who have not been here, let me explain Romans chapter 12 because it's all about relationships. What most people think that when it comes to Christianity, it's about following the rules, it's about making sure you do this and you're here. As a matter of fact, when I was growing up in the church, in order to be considered faithful, you needed to be there on Sunday morning for Bible class, Sunday service, Sunday night service, and Wednesday night service. And if you weren't there for all four of those services, you were not as faithful as people who were. But let me explain this to you. Bible doesn't say anything about being a part of a service as being a disciple. What it says to you is your relationships, and the number one relationship you have to be right with is your relationship with God. So if you look down here and you see the RG, that's your relationship with the God. The second one is RW, that's your relationship with the world. And then there's RS, and that's your relationship with yourself. If you don't have your relationship with yourself correct, you're going to be messed up for the rest of your life. And then you have your relationship with believers, and then you have your relationship with unbelievers. So Romans chapter 12 is all about relationships. And your first and foremost priority is your relationship with God. And I've got it in your notes that last week, it's not about renunciation, it's about reevaluation. It's not about renunciation, it's about reevaluation. And the reason why I'm bringing you up to speed on this is because for a long time, people have thought Christianity is about, I can't do this, and I shouldn't do this, and this is wrong, and this is right, and I need to make sure I'm doing what's right. But it's not just about renunciation. It's about reevaluation. Remember last week when I told you the fictitious story about Stan and him getting his baseball cards? I thought it was hilarious that I had one of our members look up the most expensive baseball card ever sold while I was preaching because they were getting into that story, right? If I had gone to just Matthew and told you about the, the guy that found the coins in the field and, and told you about, the, you wouldn't have listened, but I told you a, a fictitious story like Jesus did. I told you a parable. Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to be like Jesus. Don't get mad at me if, if you thought I was deceiving you. I wasn't. I even told you last week I, I wasn't telling the truth about this. But, but while I was telling the story, were any of you upset that Stan found that baseball card and had to sell everything that he owned in order to buy that house to get that baseball card and to become filthy rich. But, but see, here's what we do with the world. We have this thing out here, and it's called God, and he's given his son Jesus. And he says, if you want the best life, follow me. And we look back at all the stuff there is in the world, and we say to ourselves, I have to give up. Wait a minute, I got, I got heaven over here. I've got the best that God has to offer over here. But I may have to give up sleeping around. I, I got... Everything that God intended for my life over here, all the good that he has in store for me, I've got eternity, I've got hope, I've got joy, I've got peace, but I may have to give up my money. 
I may have to give up my ego. And last week we talked about how it's not renunciation of these things, it's about reevaluating what we've got, what God gives us. And so I, I want to start our lesson about this because I want you to see if you don't want to miss God's best for your life, you have to give up this in order to get this. But the problem is, is we have a lot of people that make a decision to follow Christ. I, I was one of those people. I made a decision at a very young age where I decided that I was going to follow Christ. I was baptized in a lake at a camp. I'm, I'll never forget the sermon because the sermon was, if you died tonight, where will you spend eternity? And I heard that sermon and I kind of got to thinking about it at, uh, the next day. And then the next night I decided I was going to get baptized and they baptized me, and I thought, this is going to be a glorious time. God is going to open up the heavens. The doves are going to sing, and people are going to hug me. We're going to, it's just going to be a magical moment. I got up out of the water. Everybody was dismissed, and they checked me for leeches. <laughs> so it wasn't really like what I planned. But, but here's, here's the thing. I made a decision to follow Christ. It wasn't until later on that I began to be a discipler. And when I became a disciple, that meant I'm starting to renounce the things that I find of value in this world. And there's a lot of people in this world today that want to make a decision to follow Christ. They want Jesus as a Savior, but they don't want Him as Lord. They want salvation, but they don't want anything else. As a matter of fact, we have a great ability to take the Bible and take the parts that we like and make that our own, and then take the parts that we dislike and we dismiss them. I had dinner with someone the other night, and they were talking to me about finding their faith and, and how they're working on that and so forth. And I said, in the midst of this, because that was their words, I'm just trying to find my faith right now. And I said, in the midst of that, just don't forget that it is God who gives you that faith. And you need to follow what he says, which is the hardest thing for us to do. You need to follow what he says. So why do we have so many decisions and so few disciples in the church today? I think the difference between, uh, there is a difference between a decision and disciples. And, and I want you to look at verse number two, the structure of the passage here. First of all, there is a negative command. And, and in this negative command, he says, Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world. And then there's the positive side of that command. And he says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then there is a purpose clause. So here's the reason why you're going to do this. You're going to take the negative command and you're going to take the positive command. And here is why you're going to. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. How many of you would like to know right now what is God's will for your life? I have had thousands of people in my office or in front of me at lunch asking me what God's will is for their life. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of times we are so consumed with God's will that we don't even talk to God about it. We talk to the preacher about it, we talk to other people about it, but we don't even talk to God about it. But if you want to know what God's will is, it's very simple. There is a negative command, and there is a positive command, and in doing those two things, you're going to be able to test, and the idea of testing there is proving whether something is God's will or it's not God's will. And in doing that, you're going to be able to know God's will. And it goes on to say His good and pleasing and perfect will. If you want what's God's best for your life, you're going to have to start by making your life a living sacrifice. And then you're going to have to go with the negative command, which is do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed, the positive command, by the renewing of your mind. And if you're ready to do that, you're ready to be a disciple. 
I want to look this morning just at the negative command. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. The idea of do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, it, there's three things here. The do not be conformed is stop being conformed. There, there's something going on in the world right now that you don't even realize that's happening to you. You are being conformed right now. He is saying, stop being conformed by the world. It is an ongoing process that's happen happening to you right now. Second thing it says here, and I love the Phillips translations here, it says, do not be squeezed into the world's mold. Do not be squeezed into the world's mold. I watch it happen every day with everything that's going on. People are being squeezed into the world's mold, whatever it is. And we do it without even thinking about it. I, I, I don't know if you take time to really think about the commercials that you're watching. But every commercial that you hear or that you watch are designed for one purpose only. And that purpose is to make you discontent. You'll either be discontent about the way you look or what you have, or you'll be discontent about something you don't know. And the next thing you know is they're trying to sell you something to get you from your state of discontent. I loved in class this morning that, that people were talking about we can focus on God and then we can turn on Fox News or CNN and the next thing we know we've lost our focus altogether. So... Don't be squeezed into the world's mold. And let her see the pattern of this world is run by Satan. The pattern of this world is run by Satan. And you need to understand that. If there's anything that I could give my children, if there's anything I could give this church, is an understanding that this world is run by Satan. We think it's run by us. We think that things are okay I was talking to my son the other day, and he was talking about some things that are going on, and I had to remind him, hey, you know Satan's at work here? Because this world is run by Satan. You, you said, well, not really, Neil. Well, look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Underline those words. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Uh, the reason why I want you to see that is because that spirit is at work for those who are disobedient. Hey, hey, I thought about this. I thought about doing a sermon called, Why Does a Cat Act Like a Cat? And, and the reason why I thought about doing that sermon, because I know there's a lot of cat lovers here in this church, and this place would be full. They would be bringing their friends who had cats, because everybody wants to know, why does a cat act like a cat? And if, you know, I've said this before, dogs have owners, cats have staff. Why do cats act like they do? I don't know, but I will tell you this, a cat acts like a cat because it is a cat's nature to act like a cat. And if you're following the prince of the kingdom of this earth, then you are going to act like your nature. So when it says here, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, if you are working in this world, if you are in this world and you're struggling with your sin, it's because you are following the king of the air. As a matter of fact, that kind of sounded funny to me when I was reading it. I, I mean, you know, who's your king? Well, he's the king of the air. It doesn't make sense. So who are you following? Well, here, here's what I want you to see on your next page. The world is counterfeit. The world system is counterfeit. They give you counterfeit security. They give you counterfeit happiness. They give you counterfeit meaning. They give you counterfeit purpose. And they'll give you counterfeit significance. Several years ago, I, I, I don't eat them anymore, so if you're watching me, do not think it's a good idea to send me jelly beans because I'm diabetic. I can't eat them now. 
If you send them, you will tempt me, and I will have to look at you and say, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> so I'm just telling you this up front so you don't get this idea, let's send the old jelly beans. But I love jelly beans. And, and the jelly belly beans, you know, the little ones, they are the best. As a matter of fact, I can walk by a jelly belly bean store and I can smell those popcorn jelly beans from outside. They are the best. And there are others in there that are just as good. And, and have you ever gotten one of those assortments and you just, they got, and you just like, oh, I wonder what this one is. And you take it and it's good. Well, I love jelly beans. And then a few years back, and I don't remember exactly when it was, they came out with this thing called Bean Boozle. Have you ever heard of that? It's where they've got nasty jelly beans mixed in with good jelly beans, and you offer them to people and see what they get. I, I, got, I got hit one time, and I don't remember what it was that I ate, but after I ate that one jelly bean, from there on out, I checked packages. Because whatever it was that I ate was nasty. It looked like a regular jelly bean. It looked like it was going to be so good and delicious. Let, let me tell you this. I did a little research. While I was thinking about this sermon, let me give you the names of the jelly beans that they try to throw off on people and bamboozle. One of them is black pepper. I can deal with that. The other one is booger. <laughs> and I'm like, how do they know what a booger tastes like? <laughs> and, and I looked online and booger has a lot of salt in it, I guess. And then there's one of dirt. I've had dirt before. There's earthworms. Who did the sampling for this? There's earwax, rotten eggs, sausage, soap, vomit, stinky socks, lawn clippings, toothpaste, barf, canned dog food, moldy cheese, baby wipes. Skunk spray, spoiled milk, stink bug, dirty dishwater, and the very last one, I say for the very best, for the last, dead fish. <laughs> Folks, everything that this world is trying to tell you that you need in order to have happiness, in order to have significance, in order to have purpose, is no different than those jelly beans I just read to you. They all look good. They all seem so right. They have pretty colors on them. The coating is shiny. They look like the real thing. They look like if you have this. But when you put it in your mouth, at first you get this delight, but later on you get stinky socks. And that's the way the world is. And that is the way Satan is working. He has given you us a counterfeit bill of significance, a counterfeit bill of happiness, a counterfeit bill of security, a counterfeit bill of purpose, a counterfeit bill of meaning. And we're buying into it. The church is so bought into the world that most people can't tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. As a matter of fact, Joel has a video I was going to have him show, and then I, I canceled it at the last moment. But after seeing Shaq's video before class, man, I was way ahead of him, <laughs> for those of you who are in class. But, but the thing of it is, the video is, is, is a woman standing in a street corner with people coming by, and you can't tell any difference between her and the rest of the world. And, and if you were to die, and we were in your funeral today, would it stand out that people knew that you were a Christian? Would it stand out that people knew that you were a follower of Christ? Or would people be surprised? Don't be deceived by the counterfeit security, happiness, and meaning, purpose, and significance of this world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world 
or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the craving of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires just pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Three things that are mentioned in there, and they're mentioned better in the King James than in the NIV. But the very first one is the lust of the flesh. And and I think a lot of us, when we hear the lust of the flesh, we think, oh, well, that's someone that's just really, really bad. Well, no, it it is the need or the lust or the passion, I'm sorry, the passion to feel. It, the, the lust of the flesh is the passion to feel. And all of us want to feel. As a matter of fact, one of the most heart-rendering things to me is when I'm talking to somebody and they're going through a very difficult time, maybe it's a loss of a family member, and they just say to me, I don't feel anything right now. We all have a passion to feel something. But instead of taking it where God wants us to do, we take it for pleasure. And that moves us into hedonism. It, it, it could be anything from sex to food to entertainment. A, a lot of us don't realize it, but we spend more time trying to entertain ourselves to make ourselves feel something than we do living a real life. I, I, I know I, I don't watch a lot of TV. I I guess I've hit that age where I think I've seen every scenario that could co- possibly come on TV right now. If you are telling me the story, and by the way, for those of you who watch Hallmark, I think they all end the same way. <laughs> Just, you know, giving you a heads up there. All right, but we, we have this desire to feel something. And you say, well, you know, I'm not going out and watching pornography. I'm not going out and, and committing adultery. I'm not sleeping around with a lot of people. Well, it, it could be your food be your problem. You, you could be eating in order to feel something. You could be watching TV. You could be watching cat videos on the YouTube all day in order to feel something. You could be watching Jeff Stevens' post every day just so you can get a laugh. I, I'm telling you, you need to watch that you're not being drawn into the world and its desires, the lust of the flesh. The next one is the lust of eyes, and that is the passion to have. That is the passion to have. That's the having possession, and that leads to materialism. I think all of us from time to time have had this dream. And and I don't know where the lottery is at this moment, but I think all of us at one time or another have thought about winning the lottery, have we not? We thought, if I won the lottery, everything would be set in my life. As a matter of fact, I'll just go ahead and confess, because Gary Stevens says I need to start confessing more on Sunday morning. I'll just confess the other day I was thinking about if I won the lottery, I I think I read somewhere where somebody won $10 million and I thought, oh, $10 million, wow, that's a lot of money. That means after taxes, I would get $5 million and I I would give probably a million and a half to the church. So I started thinking, well, after I gave a million and a half church, and the reason why I want to do that is I want to pay off the debt and I want to pay my salary for the last uh, several years that you guys have Uh, had me work for you so I want to get that out of the way because I don't want anybody to come behind me and say you know we made Neil who he is today (laughs) and then I got to thinking what would I do with the three and a half I've got left and it's nothing more than the lust of the eyes because as I was thinking about that I was thinking I have everything Thing I ever wanted in this life and more than I need. But I want more because it's the lust of the eyes. And so I, I, I repented right then and there. And I said, God, whatever you do, don't make me rich. Don't make me rich, God, because if you make me rich, I'll lose sight of you. And so instead of praying for riches, 
We need to do the Lord's Prayer and ask for our daily bread and let God meet our needs. And then finally, the pride of life, and that's the passion to be, and that's position, and that turns into egotism. And, and, and that is in all kinds of, of ways that we, we, this passion to be, we want to be athletic, we want to be uh, a model, we want to be a YouTube star, we want to have lots of followings on Facebook and on TikTok and, and whatever Snappy Chatty is or whatever it is, we want... We want, we want it all, don't we? And, and it, it doesn't just desire there. Some people do it with education. They want to be the most educated person and they want to have all these letters behind their names and they have to be. And it, and it goes on from there, even to preachers where they want to be a big man in the brotherhood in terms of preachers. This passion to be is not bad until it gets in. So you, you want a position so that you can have power, so that you can have prestige, so that you can feed your ego. Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 7, these three areas are what tempted Adam and Eve. These three things. And then if you go over to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, when Jesus was being tempted, these Three things are how Jesus was tempted. This is not uncommon. This is very common. Because the prince of the air, the rulers of the air, the ruler of the air is in control of what's going on in the world. And if we're not careful, we're going to be squeezed into its mold. Now, I've got two questions for you this morning as I wrap this up because I've only gotten through the first half of this one verse. Uh, I was thinking today as I was preparing this sermon that if I don't move any faster, we will still be in Romans chapter 12 at the end of the year. I promise to pick it up, but these two verses are critical. Let, let, let me just say this to you. Here's my first question for you. Can you say, I'm not being conformed by the world? That, that's, a, that's a tough question. Can you really say, I'm not being conformed by the world? And, and I, I want you to know, I ask myself that question. And I realize I've bought into a lot of counterfeit things in this world. And we need to make sure we're not being bought in. We're not being squeezed into the world's mold by thinking that we have to have certain things. I was talking to a, a friend of mine this morning. Uh, he's a waiter over where I go get breakfast, and he and I were talking, and uh, he was telling me about buying a, a gun part. And I'm like, really? You know, what, what are you going to be doing with a suppressor? Who are you going to be killing? Is what I wanted to know. Just make sure it wasn't me. <laughs> and, and, and I asked him, I said, Miguel, what? What, why did you buy this? He says, Neil, I really don't know, but I went over to my neighbor's house and he had one and I grabbed his and it felt so good holding it that I wanted one just like his. <laughs> and I thought to myself, Neil, you are no different than anyone else. Somebody gave me a signed letter by Dwight Eisenhower. It was a gift. I didn't buy it. And I thought, that is such a cool gift for somebody to give someone. And, I, and my, dad, my dad is a Harry Truman fan. And, and he is just, he had a dream one time that he and Harry Truman met and they were talking. And I asked him, I said, Dad, what did Truman say? He says, he didn't say anything. I did all the talking. <laughs> so I went online. I went online. And I'm going to just tell you that I, think, I, I haven't seen my dad in over a year and I'm looking forward. He's gotten a vaccination, and I'm looking forward to seeing him in person, seeing my mom and dad and hugging him in person. And so his birthday's coming up, and I, got, I went online, and I found a signed letter by Harry Truman. I'm, I'm, I, 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 this is great. And then I saw another one, and I thought, well, that one's just way expensive. But they say you can bid on it, so I bid on it. In the meantime, I was like, 
oh, this other letter, if I don't get it, it might be gone. So I'm not going to get that one. I'll just go ahead and get this one. Well, two days later, I got the other one too. So I've got two letters from Harry Truman now. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with the second one? I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll frame it and put it in my office next to the one I've already got. And, and I was telling somebody about it, and they said, well, you know, my favorite president is Theodore Roosevelt. I'm like, hmm, got to get his signature now. <laughs> and I went home, and I went online, and, and I thought to myself, what is this going to cost? And I'm going through, and I thought to myself, what are you doing, Neil Farr? You're getting caught up in something you know nothing about and you don't even need. But that's not the first time it's happened. You remember my friend Stan I told you about last week? One time he came here and he says, Neil, I'm really kind of looking for Hot Wheel cars right now. Will, will, will you go with me to Walmarts? And K that's back when they had Kmarts. And, and will you go with me? And let's look for these kinds of cars. And so he was telling me about it. And we went to every Walmart, every Kmart in the entire Tampa Bay area. I'm talking about St. Pete. I'm talking about Clearwater. We spent two days going to Walmart and Target or and, and, and Kmart's looking for Hot Wheel cars. And most of the time they just dumped them in a bin. So you had to go through the whole bin to get through them. And so I'm with him, and he's telling me, you know, he finds a car, and he says, this one, you pay 97 cents for him, but this one's worth $3. And before I knew it, guess what I had bought? <laughs> Hot Wheel cars. I got so caught up into being squeezed into the world's mold that I forgot where my priorities were. And it happens to all of us every day. And if you're in this audience today and you can say, I am not being conformed to this world, I want to talk to you. Because A, either you've got something that I don't know about, or B, you're a good liar. The final question for you today is this. Are you going to be a follower or a fan? Are you going to be a follower or a fan? What I'm trying to get at here in this series of lessons is we've got to quit doing this church thing. We've got to quit thinking we are in the right place because we come to church, we know when to sing, we know when to bow our heads, we know what the Bible says about this and what the Bible says about this, and we need to quit being a fan of the church. It's like going to the game this afternoon. You can be a fan, but unless you're on the field, you're not playing the game. And we need to get in the field. Jesus' words never rang truer than they do today. The fields are ripe for harvest. And we can know our Bible. We can know why we do what we do. And we can attend services, and we can sing the songs, and we can hit the right keys, well, at least most of us can. And we know when to bow our, prayer, bow our heads. I remember when I was growing up, they had song books in the back of, the, of the, the chairs or the pews. And when you knew when the preacher was winding down, that was my wake-up call. My dad was the preacher. That was my wake-up call is when I heard that chair or that book grab a part of that back of that chair and just scrape on that. That was like uh, the alarm bell. Oh, it's almost over. Until we got that guy that came up and prayed for three hours. And you know who you are. Here's my point. I'm tired of being a fan. I want to be a follower. I want to dedicate the rest of my days here on this earth of being a disciple who makes disciples. And all I'm asking today is for you to come on that journey with me. I'm not asking you to renounce the things of this world. I'm asking you to reevaluate 
what's ahead of us in heaven. I'm not asking you that you've got to quit being who you are. I'm asking you to look to God for who you really are. And in doing so, you'll have a prize above all prize. The lesson is yours as we stand and sing.